Hello Southend, this is Southend TV. My name is Tracy Chapman and today I'm talking to Julian Ware Lane, who is the prospective parliamentary candidate for the Labour Party on the election on June the 8th. Hello Julian, very nice to meet you. Hello, nice to meet you as well Tracy. Could you tell me a little bit about yourself and your association with Southend? I have a, a long association uh, in, in so far that I was actually born, I was a home birth in West on sea so I was born up. Front, downstairs front room of 401 Fairfax Drive, um, so I'll wait the blue plaque. Um, yeah, I'm 57 years old, five or six. Um, I work in the IT industry, information technology, so I used to be a programmer, now a, a quality assurance tester, test analyst. Um, I'm a long-term activist, a former football referee as well. Been involved in local sports for 30 years. Not that I can play very well, but I've been involved. <laughs> uh, and um, I, in, in my community, I've been the school's governor. Um, I've represented the Labour Party at various levels internally, uh, and I also represent the Labour Party on the local council. Uh, I'm one of, the, one of the three councillors for Milton Ward. And you've been a prospective parliamentary candidate before in the yeah, same area? Yeah, I've been the pedant, I wouldn't use the word prospective. I've been an actual parliamentary candidate uh, three, in three, three, pre, the three previous general elections. In 2005, I, I uh, came second in Rayleigh, 2010 came third in Castle Point, and 2015 came second in South End West. Okay, well that's really nice to know that you've been so involved locally. Yeah. Um, a little bit about what's going on today, because today the, the Labour Party manifesto mm -hmm. has been launched, mm -hmm. and we know that there are a number of new policies in that, and a number of financial commitments, mm -hmm. and I wondered if you'd like to tell us about those. Well, I haven't read the, the manifesto in detail, but the bits and pieces that I've picked up uh, look very promising. I think it's a manifesto that will have, should appeal, um, and uh, there's been a lot, of, um, a lot said about about the commitments, but there's clearly some tax raising issues, um, commitments in there as well. Some of the things that the headlines that struck me was the talk, the talk about freezing um, income tax rates for for the 95% who earn less than 80,000 a year, so it's guarantees for all new working families that they won't see their taxes increase. Uh, but for those who, the top 5% of earners, they will, will, will be asked to shoulder a little bit more, not, not, not high tax rate, rates of tax, but a little bit more to help pay for things like uh, the National Health Service, about improvements to education and, and the such like. Um, there's a, a strong commitment to education in there. Um, the, the, the reintroduction of EMA, uh, Educational Maintenance Allowance, which helped young families able, be able to afford further education. Uh, the scrapping of tuition fees, um, which is something like 9,000 a year currently, so it leaves, leaves uh, university graduates with a huge debt to contemplate uh, once their income reaches a certain level, they've got to start paying back. So I think they're very positive things, very aspirational things. And I think in a, as a, this nation approaches independence from Europe and has to sort of weather some choppy, choppy economic storms, I've no doubt, uh, we definitely need a skilled workforce and therefore encouraging people to go to university without the fear of debt is something that's a very positive move in my opinion. I understand that, but the, the rate of, um, the higher rate of income tax is mm -hmm. going to kick in much lower now, which will bring in people like doctors and, and head teachers, people in the public sector. Quite yeah, my understanding is yeah. that it's going, it's going to be, it's currently 40% above about 37,000 or something currently, uh, but you d the, the new higher rates were 45p, 45% at 80,000 and 50% at 123,000. And don't forget, it's only payable for that portion of in your income above those levels as well. So whilst it's true that there, there will be um, head teachers and doctors who will pay uh, something. Um, it, it's not going to be going to be not talking huge amounts of money. It's an extra five percent on the on that portion of the income that's above that threshold. But when the payoff is, and particularly for GPs, and they're paying a little bit of extra tax, but it, that, that tax is going to be used to invest in the NHS. And one can argue they're paying in one hand and even getting it back in the other. So, you know, end of the day, we have to make tough choices. Um, I, you know, we all pay tax. Now we'd all argue for zero tax if we could, but we all want public services as well. And there's a, there's a huge issue locally about public services. And there are a number of policies in there, uh, nationalisation policies, mm -hmm. um, that are at the moment uncosted. I don't think they've managed to, to give us the figures for those today. I believe it's all fully costed, but of course the argument uh, would also run that if, for instance, you, you, you nationalise something which is currently making a profit, then it's, it's a, a profit will re revert to the taxpayer. Um, but they were, they were talking about renationalising things with effectively monopolies anyway, like water and rail. 
And, and how, why do you think that government is better at running those things than private business? Well, because the idea of privatisation was about introducing competition. And whether it's genuine competition, I certainly don't have a problem with that. But when I turn on my tap, I don't have a choice of which water supply. When I go down to Westcliff Station, which is my local railway station, I don't have a choice of trains. There's no competition. The competition doesn't exist. So uh, the idea of bringing them back in-house, I think, makes sense. And effectively as well, we have, particularly the water companies, are effectively nationalised anyway. They're just not nationalised by British companies. They're nationalised by, by French and German companies. So what we're all we're effectively doing is transferring which, which state owns them. Um, so you, I think, you think that the Labour Party could make a better fist of running the rail line from Westcliff to well, like, well, from from uh, Shoebury to, to London and C two C, which seems to me, as someone that's used the other line, is an exceptionally good line. I I, I don't have any complaints about C two C, but there are an awful lot of lines lines around the country which have got severe problems, and it's not the Labour Party, of course. It's still it's, it will still be a, a rail company of sort owned by the state, so there will be rail professionals running it. Uh, but yes, I mean, I think I think it's difficult to imagine with some of some of the issues we've had with the East Coast line and that being. Under you know being brought under uh, some sort of ombudsman, ombudsman, ombudsman to run, I don't imagine that we could do any worse. Uh, and it, it, you know, if there are problems, the, uh, these franchises are not doing delivering for the for the, for the rail user. And then I think that's a good argument to bring it back in house. And another thing that I understand was in mm. the uh, manifesto today was to bring the age of retirement back to sixty six. Well, personally, as I'm facing 67, I guess I, I, I would be in favour of that. But yes, I mean, I think um, particularly, you know, if you've been working all your life, I've, I celebrate uh, 40, 40 years of work last November. Uh, and I don't personally have a particular issue with going another 10 years because I sit at a desk and play with, uh, on a computer. But a lot of people with long working careers, you know, those extra one or two years are, are a challenge. And but, of course, but the cost uh, of that uh, is, is, I understand, 300 billion. I just wonder where you were going to find that kind of. I am money not from. a Treasury spokesman, so I don't have the figures in my head, but I, my understanding, and it's been ap absolutely true of all the previous Labour manifestos and Labour. Um, um, party when they've been in government and they're all fully fos fully costed and fully funded so um, small rises well taking corporation tax back to former levels for instance small modest rises in uh, in um, income tax of as we discuss um, and if for instance we nationalize rail and water then the profits that they currently make will, rather than going to share, foreign shareholders will come to the UK taxpayer so there, there are ways of raising them but I don't you know if you're asking me the detail on this I, I'm not over that I have to and, and I understand it's yeah. difficult it's today and I've, I've not really had a chance mm. to read it other than, than the headlines today yeah. let's move on to South End um, mm -hmm. what particular issues are you going to be campaigning on in South End well, there's a lot of issues. I mean, South End's a great place. I mean, I'm not well, I'm here to run it down, but I mean, as much as I love my hometown, I can see problems with it. But I mean, I think there are three big issues which I, I in my conversations with residents, have come, come to the fore. Uh, one is the future health services in the borough. Uh, you may well be uh, may well be aware there's a thing called SDP, a Sustainability and Transformation Plan, and that's having uh, potentially have a huge impact on the South End University Hospital. Um, for, you know, the headline is about the downgrading of accident and emergency provision, which I think is a real worry for residents. It's a real worry for me personally. I think. Uh, and why is it a worry? Well, because the proposal is that all accidents and emergencies in the, the south of es the south of Essex, which would include Basildon, you know, Thurrock. Chelmsford, a huge chunk of Essex will all go to one place. But but my understanding is that you'll still be able to go to the accident and emergency at Southend if you if you have an accident on the football field. We know that that that's a big mm. issue at the weekends, or if one of the kids falls off their bike, you'll still be able to go to Southend to have that seen <coughs> to. But my understanding is the bigger things like strokes and well, heart attacks that will be dealt with. I mean, you may you will be right. There's not a huge great deal of clarity on some of this, but from what I've seen. Um, the the blue lights. So if you take if you do break a leg on a football field, and I've, I've seen one or two of those in a long uh, refereeing career, uh, then you'll get taken to Basildon. Uh, so anything that where you've been been taken to hospital by an ambulance. Uh, if you're walking wounded, and I've been walking wounded, and so have my family at times, then it all depends on the time of day. Um, if you're the, the the proposal is that um, Basildon has a full fully functioning 24-hour A and E. Whereas South End, if it becomes a yellow hospital, that which is the preferred option, then you'll you'll be fine up to ten o'clock in the evening. So if it's five past ten, and little Johnny sprains his ankle doing something, but Johnny should be in bed. Well, possibly. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, little Johnny might be your husband or something. No, but whatever. You, whoever, if you're um, someone who's had a, 
had a, a, a glass and a half of shandy and a trip on a curb stone at, at five past ten, then you can't, you don't have the facility to go to South End, and that introduces all sorts of issues as well because it's, it's where, how do you get out? Where do you, where do you, how do you get home in the middle of the night? Uh, if people want to visit you and things like this. So it does, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an issue there. But more importantly, of course, is if you know, you're unfortunate enough to have a heart attack in, in Wakering or Chubiness, uh, and where seconds are critical. Uh, the thought of driving past South End to go all the way to Basildon before you can be, sick, you know, before you be admitted to the hospital is, is quite disturbing. And the, the studies show that for every kilometre or extra you travel, your your your, your chances of survival diminish. I mean, not by a huge amount, but I mean, you know, when seconds count, you know, I think it's it's important. And I think as well, we we we're a, we have a town with an expanding airport, and there's all the issues about you know air travel normally safe, but there sometimes are incidents. We have eight or nine miles of shoreline, and the only, in, in the summer we've got something like six million visitors. Um, you know, if there's anyone has gets into trouble, you know, we want them put, you know, d deposited in the closest uh, hospital and get sorted out, not dragged off to Basildon. And and you said there were three main. Oh yes, oh yeah. So, <laughs> well, the second one is what's been happening to the local school funding. Uh, under the current government, uh, we've seen every single school in South End have its budget sl slashed. Uh, and I, and uh, but I, I understood that there was a consultation, but I didn't think that had happened yet. Uh, it's in the proposals, and it's certainly going it to happen from what I can see. Yeah, from what I can see, and I think uh, you know, in, in reverse to what my, my party and myself would like to do, which is to put more money into education and, and make sure it's fully funded. I think uh, that, that every single school su suffering a cut in the funding from government is a real concern. So that's, that's the second issue that we're talking to residents about and asking them. And of course that all affects almost everyone, parents, grandparents, or you may be uncle or auntie or whatever. So that's a huge issue, for, particularly for a town like South End, which is got, where most people are aspirational, where we have London on our doorstep, Europe's not far away. We need to have highly skilled and highly qualified children. And if the budgets are being slashed, that education's going to suffer. There's no two ways about it. The third issue... Um, oh, can I just go back to the education yeah, one? Can, yeah. um, we, we have grammar schools, much-loved grammar schools yes. in South End. How do you feel about those? Well, I think much-loved is an interesting uh, description. Excuse me. Because I was the, I was the councillor, I was elected in 2012, 2012, who highlighted the fact that one of the grammar schools only takes one, one quarter of its intake from within South End, and the others from only one third. So much loved by the people who go there, but unfortunately not, there aren't many of South End's pupils actually going into the schools. And when you look at uh, things like that, um, access to free, you know, the, um, entitlement to free school meals, you realise that whilst it's described as an enabler for poorer people to climb the social ladder, the reality is, is the reverse of that. So you don't support the grammar schools? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't approve of segregation at all. Uh, by subjects, by streaming, absolutely. Um, but I don't see under, understand why we have to go to separate schools. What, what about the um, the Catholic schools? If you don't agree with the segregation of pupils, I would. I don't agree with segregation by by faith either. I, I whilst I accept that they deliver an excellent education, I think that all children should be mixed mixed together. And I think it's when you start separating, you start potentially introducing problems. And we've seen in parts of the UK, for instance, in Northern Ireland, in Liverpool, in Glasgow sectarianism that can arise and because if you're not mixing with everyone it's very easy to say well you know we're Catholics or Protestants or whatever the segregation is I, I have an issue with that I'm not looking to overturn that initially but I think we need to start looking at policy which says every child should, you know we should integrate we should be a more tolerant and more integrated society thank you and your third issue my third issue is, is, is police numbers uh, this government's attack on public services affects every public service including police uh, we are, my, I represent Milton Ward, which has the highest crime stats of any ward in Essex. And in my conversations with residents as a local councillor, uh, I frequently have conversations about antisocial behaviour, about drug dealing, about all sorts of things, alcohol-related crime and, and such like. And the, the reality is, of course, with fewer and fewer police, it's a lot more problematical about trying to guarantee Bobby's on the beat in, in, the, in some of the hot, hot spots and with a high, two high streets in my ward and the, and the nightclubs and, and some of the other issues that are out there as well. 
we, we, we are, the police are struggling to cope. And the frightening statistic is of, of the, all the calls, of, I mean, 999 calls are normally answered, but all, for all the, one, the 101 calls that are made, only half get dealt with. So if you ring 101 because you've got a problem, you stand a one in, two, one in two chance of having that uh, issue dealt with. And that's purely down to police numbers. It isn't, just is not the numbers of staff. And my, uh, my understanding uh, is that the police and the fire service are, are, are thoroughly demoralised by what's happening. You know, they don't want to see, they want to serve their communities. And it's very difficult to serve it when the government keeps cutting budgets and cutting budgets and cutting budgets. And we see the close, close of local police stations. You know, I live just around the corner from Westley Police Station, but we have Lee, Shubiness and, and other places where they're no lo- there is no longer desks there. We, if you want to go and see a policeman at a desk, you've got to go to Southend, Southend Centre as well. And I think that is an issue. I wouldn't like just to touch on the airport. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that there is uh, a big business park going on there. Mm-hmm. I've heard up to 7,500 jobs. I don't know how true that is. All of those people have got to live somewhere. Mm-hmm. Southend is very constrained. Uh, in in terms of land, there aren't very many places you can build new houses, and I suspect many of those jobs will attract people with families. They're mm-hmm. going to need more than the the bed sits, the, of which we do have quite a few in Southend. Mm-hmm. And I wondered what um, what you th- you felt about that. Well, you know, firstly, of course, you know there will be um, there is local unemployment. It's not a, fortunately not particularly high, but you'd hope that uh, local Southend residents would be amongst those who would take the jobs up. But yes, it was likely to to attract people from outside of the town as well and they you know if they're not within commuting distance of of the of the, uh, the airport park you know the, the um, industrial park then of course they may be looking to live here um, there are constraints on the borough but we need house building we need house building for south end's residents we need house house building for the homeless and for those sitting on on housing waiting lists as well and i think we've there are some creative solutions about doing that i mean if you look at the old echo site for instance a brownfield site where they're putting a large number of homes on. You look down Victoria Avenue, uh, the office blocks there have been turned into accommodation, the old college building, Carnarvon Road. So there are brownfield solutions. Um, but it is a challenge, there's no denying that there's a challenge there. And I think for me, um, there is an awful lot of development going on currently. Uh, I'm not always convinced it's the right sort of development. You know, you don't see a lot of low, low cost, affordable housing going up. You, you see a lot of quite expensive. Um, flats and on the seafront, which I'm not saying we shouldn't have any of those, but I think that there should be a drive to try and house our people in our own borough who ne- can't currently afford to, to buy anywhere. Just a quick question I should touch on, and that's, that's Jeremy Corby and your leader, uh-huh. um, and I just wondered how you felt that that would affect your, compa- your campaign in Southend. Well, as I like to remind everyone, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, he's up for election in Islington. Uh, if you want to vote for the Labour candidate in South and West, it's my name is on the ballot paper. Um, I imagine he, I mean uh, we seem to be heading towards increasingly more presidential styles of elections. But actually, with no one elects a prime minister, the prime minister is chosen by the party with the greatest number of MPs. Uh, if we're lucky enough to have the greatest number of MPs, then we will choose the leader from amongst our PLP. But voters in South End have got a choice. The South End West have got a choice. They're either content with the status quo, which is, which is a Conservative government that's intent on reducing school budgets, moving health services out of South End, uh, fewer police officers, and all the other things that are going on as well. Or they they want pu- proper public services. They want a future uh, for for their children. Where the, there are schools, where there are police officers on the beat, and not, and in, in, in increasing rather than diminishing numbers, and they have a, and health services in the borough, which are fit for, and uh, for everyone in the borough. And that's the simple choice between me and Sir David Amos. Um, Jeremy Corbyn, nor Theresa May, for that matter either, are standing in Southend at this election. Julian, locally there's been some concern about the corporation tax and the rise, mm-hmm. uh, particularly amongst the smaller businesses, and I wondered if you could address that for us. Yes, well, uh, you know, Labour has spending plans and tax has to be raised, um, but the, 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 the corporation tax issue is we're only reverting back to where they were just a few years ago, so to describe it as a rise I think is a little bit disingenuous to some extent, we're just going back to where we were. And historically, and you know, look at uh, where we, it's historically low, and you look at where we compare to our European neighbours, I still think we're actually amongst the lowest in terms of corporation tax. So whilst I understand the concerns of those who work in the private industry, and I am one of those, and though clearly I want uh, jobs as much as anyone else, uh, I, don't, I think they're fairly modest rises. Um, I mean, Labour is the party of jobs. I mean, that's why our name talks about it, is being jobs. So I think we are about job creation, ultimately. Uh, and, for instance, we talk about house building. 
uh, program, and that will create jobs as well. And you know, I do like to remind everyone that the record period of growth in all of history occurred under the last Labour government. We broke all records going back, you know, back to two, three hundred years ago in terms of successive periods of growth. Uh, and you know, so, and that was managed. Uh, yes, admittedly, we inherited a reasonably good economy from John Major, but we sustained that. So our record, actually, in government is excellent. And it only came to an end in 2008 when there was an international banking crisis, of which, of course, we had no control over. So I think it, you're, it's absolutely right that we make sure we have to monitor this and we don't damage our job prospects. But we've got a program for to, you know, reinvest in public services do things like house bidding and stuff like that, that's got to be paid for. And I think all we're always suggesting is a return to where we were just a few years ago in terms of corporation tax. But realistically, if, mm. if that rise happens and people do lose their jobs, how do you feel about that? Because that, is a, that will have an impact on, on oh. Southend. It, it is a, a town of small businesses. Yeah, well, and it's a community town for the City of London as well. So, yes, I do. I, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, you know, if it happens, and I sincerely... I hope it doesn't, and you know I think like, the Labour government, the Labour Party in government, has always been very mindful of job creation. But if it does happen, that then uh, you know the Labour Party in, in government will have to rethink its strategy. I don't think they're about to, uh, you know, commit us to depression and in jobs and high job losses. End of the day, we're a party of workers. We want jobs, and we're not going to do anything to, to damage that. Uh, uh, and what happens if some of the bigger corporations? who can move abroad to mm. do and take well, their, their jobs with them. Well, that becomes a real problem, and uh, and that, that's already uh, a, a prospect with the with Brexit as well, because they're not, not being linked to Europe. Uh, in my uh, industry, which is the automotive industry, there are already threats about moving companies, so it's, it's a worry all round, and we've got to make sure that we are competitive. But I don't th I think, I already, th so as I said earlier, I already think we are competitive. In terms of rates of corporation tax, we already sit at the bottom of the table in terms of the, right, the numbers. So I think we are we have a good offer already, uh, and a modest rise will still won't impact on that at all. So I still think it will be will still be competitive. But it's not difficult for people to move from here to Ireland, and they've got historically low corporation tax. Yeah, well, yeah, although Ireland's a tiny economy, so whilst it's true that you could step across the border uh, into Ireland, it, for a tiny economy, there's only so many people they can take. But if to you've if you've been to Dublin and seen the amount of building that's going on there, the amount of office space that's being created, they are expecting oh, jobs uh, to come. Yeah, Dublin's uh, Dublin's done very well for itself. Uh, undoubtedly, and I have been to Dublin, so I've, and I've seen a bit of that myself. Um, but no, as I said, you know, I, I'm confident that it's a, a, we have a properly costed manifesto, that these plans have been thought through, that a modest rise to fund um, education, for instance, for our young people, so we will have an educated workforce. I mean, if corporation tax means we have an uneducated workforce, I don't understand how that uh, actually would help businesses, businesses to compete with the type of economies to compete with China, uh, Russia, America, and with Europe no, like now that we're no longer a partner with Europe, we've got to have an educated workforce. And the only way we're going to, going to get that is by encouraging your young people to go and get the qualifications needed. And by saying to them, well, instead of imposing £27,000 worth of tuition fees on you, we're going to say you won't have any tuition fees. I think that is an encouragement to them, so I'm, I think that's a positive thing. So whilst we're losing a little bit, maybe, in terms of corporation tax, some of the, some of the companies will, will take a bit of a hit, there's no denying that, but I think if they end up with a much more educated workforce as a result of it, then I think it's a win-win. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the people of Southend before we close? Well, a reminder that uh, Labour are second in both parts of the town, so for those who aren't attracted by the, the thought of further austerity, further cuts to public services, there is an alternative. The alternative is the Labour Party. We're the best place to, to, to t take the fight to the Conservatives in the borough. And I think our manifesto is a really positive, you know, it has some really positive things in it. I think tuition fees, EMA, I think the privatisation things that you talked about. And I you know and our commitment to Trident, you know, we are often po portrayed as a party that would leave um, Britain naked in the in, 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 in defence of the realm, but that's clearly not true. Again, I suppose when your leader says he wouldn't push the button, it kind of takes away the need for that as a deterrent. I wonder well, where, why you put it into your manifesto at all. If you well, because it. he com he's committed to, def to defend his country. He's reluctant, and I would rather have a leader who thinks twice before doing that, quite frankly, than someone who's gung ho. Um, so I, you know, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But I think you know, Labour was. I mean, we we helped. We were in the coalition in the last World War. Well, Tony Blair took us to war. 
Uh, so we're not a party that's afraid to defend the realm, um, but I think it's right that we do it with, you know, we don't just press the button, press the button and say, actually, send the troops in at the drop of a hat. I think we need to take a much more considered approach, and I think that that's the approach of the Labour Party. Well, thank you very much for coming in to thank see you. me. Um, do remember, everybody, there is an election on June the 8th. Do make sure you get yourself registered and do go out and vote. Thank you. It's been thank really you. nice to meet you. Thank you.